Southern Oregon PBS collaborates with the Jefferson Exchange on the podcast, Us As We Are. Here's host Keegan Van Hook. Howdy, folks. I'm Keegan Van Hook from Southern Oregon PBS, and this is Us As We Are. Today, I'm going to share two stories from my recent travel around the region. In a bit, we're going to take things back to the days of our most recent 2023 fire season, when the Flat Fire loomed in the coast range and the name Agnes suddenly sprung into public awareness. The where and what of this rural community is something we'll explore. But first, I want to share a more recent story pertaining to broader implications of our world's changing climate. The 16 million year old McDermott Caldera rides the border between Oregon and Nevada. On the ground, most of what there is to see are rolling hills covered in sagebrush. In the late summer and early fall, the primary color of the world here is brown. As we'll learn, there are those who find this place beautiful, but many others see emptiness. However, the McDermott caldera is thought to be the world's largest deposit of naturally occurring lithium, the primary component of the batteries that make electric cars possible and allow power storage for renewable energy technologies like solar and wind. Lithium is ostensibly a part of our eco-friendly future. The only problem is that lithium mining itself comes with its own environmental costs, and this area's indigenous Paiute, Shoshone, and Bannock people consider the location of the caldera's current largest mining project a sacred place, Thacker Pass or Pihimuha. In this story, we're talking with members of the indigenous environmental activist group People of Red Mountain to learn about the folks who oppose the idea of lithium as being a part of our environmentally friendly future. So I want to welcome everyone. Um, we're here for the third commemoration of the Pihima massacres, um, 1865, September 12th. I just want to thank everyone for showing up in person, for being here. This year, you know, we are witnessing the infliction, the wound on the land. Uh, my name is Kaila Farrell-Smith. I'm a Klamath uh, Modoc tribal member, and I'm a professional artist, and I've been um, also doing environmental activist work for almost 20 years. That work kind of combined has brought me out here to Pihimaha. This is a huge deposit of lithium. There's actually large deposits of lithium all throughout the McDermott caldera. It's a very hot commodity at the moment with this huge push for a transition to electric vehicles. During the Trump's administration during COVID, they just gave the permits to Lithium Nevada, which is the subsidiary of Lithium America. So Lithium America's Canadian corporation, they got the permit, so that's why they have dug ground. I believe right now that they've put the water line in, so when you drive in here, we did have to cross over the water line. The event we attended took the form of a campout, a sort of small-scale environmentalist festival, <laughs> with conversations, presentations, and a potluck lunch by day, and more conversation by the campfire at night. We were in the shadow of a prominent rock called Sentinel Peak, overlooking the big empty basin of Thacker Pass, which was showing the early signs of new industrialization. Giant dump trucks and work vehicles were kicking up lots of dust, and the beginning of a mine pit was being cleared of vegetation. It sure looked like a mine, but the history of this place was a mystery to us. My name is Myron Smart, and I'm from the Port McDermott tribe. This is where we, we hid from the Calvary when the Calvary's came after us, when the Calvary's chased us. And then when they saw us from clear across the mountain from the other side, and then they came, they came out here and they massacred everybody, women and children, you know, old, old people, everybody. What happened? Why did they commit such an atrocity? One of the ranchers called out to Winnemucca and said, hey, you know, there's, these Indians are being hostile out here. And which is, they, they were not even doing that. They were just trying to beg them for food because, you know, that certain, year is when when we had a really tough winter i mean the snow was really deep and then they came to here because this is this is one of their getaway places because because of the peak here they that they, they, it was like a like a lookout for them and then they seen the fire over here like campfires they called it like a war party and then they came here you know wee hours in the morning while everybody was asleep and then they came and you know attacked and massacred everybody here that happened on September 12, 1865. I'm Gary McKinney, Duck Valley Shoshone Paiute. You know, those who passed away and made that journey to the Milky Way, you know, they, they're they buried out here. Before the interest in lithium began, Thacker Pass was mostly BLM land, open for public recreational use, including by the indigenous community. 
However, one very old law forms the fundamentals of how mining claims in the United States are established, the General Mining Act of 1872. This law opens public lands, like BLM land, to mineral prospecting and mining. Anyone can stake a claim if they pay the appropriate fees, file the right paperwork, and respect current regulation in their state, doing things like holding public comment periods before starting mining in earnest. But regulations cannot counteract the General Mining Act. Mining claims are given a priority over other land uses, and thus we have the activity we see now in Thacker Pass. Uh, my name is Day Hinky. I'm a community member of People Red Mountain, one of the members. It, we put a committee together when we found out that this mine was going to go through. We gathered a few people up and started spreading the word, and they were like, we don't know what's going on. I've never heard about this. I'm like, well, they just passed it. During, in the middle of COVID, you know, the tribes were shut down, tribal offices were shut down, people were sick. That's when they passed the permits for the Thacker Pass lithium mine. Everybody was hiding in your house and no government buildings were open. I guess it was a great time for the federal government to say, hey, let's pass these, let's get some things done. And they basically said, well, nobody made a public comment, so we took that as nobody cares for the land. We were told not to go nowhere by the governments. What they did is I guess they sent a letter in the mail in 2020 to the Fort McNamara Tribal Council, and that was their consultation, they call it. Nevada, there's so many different tribes that, are, that consider this um, sacred. Then you go into Oregon, there's Burns Paiute tribes, there's the Klamath Modoc tribes. We're a Klamath Modoc Yahuskin Paiute tribes. There's so many tribes that need to be consulted. What are some of the environmental problems with potentially mining lithium? Mainly it's the pollution of groundwater, the amount of water you need to, um, to be processing the sulfuric acid processing plant. It's going to deplete the water. And this is already, I mean, this is a... This is the desert. <laughs> mm -hmm. Antelopes and deers and rabbits and the sage grouse, you know, they, they migrate, you know, through there. And, you know, now, now look what they're doing. To, they're destroying everything. So, uh, my name is Sean Grasso. I'm a, a documentary filmmaker making a documentary about the ecosystem here and the community and also the uh, potential for renewable energy out here. And so I found out about the story of the sage grouse out here, just how their populations are declining and there's all these different factors to that. But a big thing was the potential lithium mine. And there's this really interesting question there where we have the potential for renewable energy, right? But you also have this great ecosystem and community disruption. We want to transition off of fossil fuels. That seems like a great idea, but are we really looking at the cost? It's, it's just it's a very fragile ecosystem. It's, um, it should be preserved and kept for, you know, the elk and the 12 golden eagles that nest out here. Yeah, th this place is like a wild garden up on that behemoth where they're going to go mine. There's tons of food up there. A potato, there's bitter root up there, onion, wild onion up there. Every mountain range is different. Every mountain range holds different things. Despite the opinions of groups like People of Red Mountain, the Tribal Council of the McDermott Reservation actually approved the presence of the Thacker Pass lithium mine, incentivized by the promised growth of the local economy. How are we going to, you know, show that we utilize the land so they can't ever say, oh, you guys aren't, you guys aren't important, you guys don't do anything. We are utilizing the land, we, and we know why. We, we have to get back on the land to get land back. The next story I want to share takes us back to our most recent summer fire season of 2023, when the name Agnes started appearing in the local news day after day in relation to the flat fire. Agnes is, or was, a person, the daughter of the first postmaster. But Agnes today is a small community in the southern coast range on the river shore at the confluence of the Rogue and Illinois rivers. It's heavily wooded with a small airstrip being the most prominent landmark. When the flat fire burned in July, the flames were right on Agnes's doorstep, threatening its existence. In late July, as soon as fire crews started to gain control and it was possible to enter the area, my team and I drove out along the remote Bear Camp Road to meet the people of Agnes and learn about life in this tucked away place. All right, so my name's Jennifer Northup and we're at Lucas Lodge in Agnes, Oregon, and I'm the sixth generation here. We're at the confluence of the Rogue and the Illinois. And yeah, it's a 
beautiful place to be. Lucas Lodge, where Jennifer lives, is a beautifully rustic old wood house painted red. Surrounding it are smaller cabins in the same style, where people come to stay for fishing or river rafting vacations. Tell me a little bit about the history of this lodge. So it was built by my great, great, great grandparents and took about 13 to 16 years. It was originally a trading post and then we started taking in guests. Uh, our first guest was a Chinese miner. So what do you do here? You, I mean, are, you're the proprietor of this establishment, aren't you? Uh, well, I run it, but my um, father and his cousins are owners and, and then I've been running it for about seven years now and cook a lot of food. We do it all. Yeah, you're busy. Didn't you say you're running this place by yourself right now? Yeah. So we do home style cooking and it's chef's choice generally. I mean, I do accommodate for people, but um, I never thought I'd be a chef. So <laughs> I just like to cook and we grow um, all of our own vegetables. Yeah, so what are you cooking tonight, Jennifer? I am making gyros tonight. Mm. Yeah. But so we've been feeding the firefighters who are the swing shift breakfast, which is 9 a.m. Come on in guys, come eat. And so it'll be a 7 a.m. breakfast for 150 and then an eight o'clock dinner for 150 and they'll go through for until the fire is out or until they change their mind. So so two meals plus my other house guest. Tell me guys, is the food good? Yeah, the food has been absolutely delicious and it's absolutely a breath of fresh air compared to typically being in a camp. It's really nice when you show up to a local community and they decide out they're just their own goodwill to really go above and beyond to make you feel appreciated. Other places scattered in the woods of Agnes share a similar charm to the Lucas Lodge, like the Little Rogue Country Store, which you'll find easily while driving through. Hi, my name is Tiffany Lucas, and we're at the Rogue Country Store in Agnes, Oregon. My family's been uh, here between Lucas Lodge and the store for about eight generations. My son's the seventh generation was working here this spring, and. So yeah, we've, we've been here for a minute. Yeah, I caught the last name, Lucas, and yeah. we're actually staying at the Lucas Lodge with uh, Jennifer and all those firefighters. Yeah. Are you related by, to Jennifer by chance? She's my cousin. We grew up here together. We actually used to work here in the summertime and we'd all work together growing up and you know picking blackberries and helping grandpa shuck corn. And I know my family homesteaded here um, and they ran cattle for a while. And then in the early 40s and 50s, that's when the lumber, timber industry, and our, the population was probably about quadruple, if not, you know, four or five times the size it is now, which is approximately 90 people that live here year round. The 90 or so people living in Agnes rely on the rivers. Fishing and river rafting are the chief reasons people go to Agnes, making it a tiny niche tourist destination. But Agnes also relies on the river to receive its mail. My first name is Corleen. My mom put that on the birth certificate and then brought me home and called me Corky. What are we doing here on the side of the, the Rogue River today? Waiting for the mail boat. Corky is the mail carrier in Agnes. Can you tell me about why there's mail boat delivery here? That's how they did it in the old days and they just kept it up. They've got the boats and they have to come up here anyway. It's from Gold Beach to Agnes and it's 64 miles by the river. Here comes the mailboat pilot, Sean Carpenter. This is the mail. Oh yeah. All right, yeah, tell me, what do you have in here? We've got mail and packages for Agnes. Nice. Picked it up at the post office this morning in Gold Beach. And gonna take it right over here to Corky and she's gonna deliver the mail today. So you're the boat mailman then. I'm the whitewater mailman. The flat fire eventually burned out. Agnes is still out there in the mountains, waiting for the next visitors to stumble upon this paradise at the confluence. It's a unique spot, and uh, you're welcome to come to here, come to Agnes. This is it. I believe it or not, this is it. <laughs> There's a whole lot more to learn about Agnes and the lithium mining situation in the McDermott caldera. If you're curious about these topics, I encourage you to find the full-length versions of these stories at sopbs.org slash usaswear and on the Us As We Are YouTube channel. We premiere a new, full documentary episode every Thursday at 8 p.m. See you soon. I'm Keegan Van Hook from Southern Oregon PBS, and this is Us As We Are.